David Axelrod in a lifetime of politics. This one sublime, sublime moment shines through. Barack Obama's wins in the 2008 Iowa caucuses helped propel him on the road to the presidency. CNN mentioned politics in mixed company these days, and the word of of often evokes the discomfort, averted eyes, and nervous asides meant to steer the conversation to safer shores. Many families reported of avoiding the subject altogether at holiday gatherings for the fear of spoiling the cause occasion by inviting on presentments between kin of different views. Today, outrage and indignation are staples of our public discourse. The main means by which many politicians raise the money and the martial support and the social media platforms keep the potential consumers online for advertisers. Our nature cradle, e pluribus unum, a Latin phrase meaning out of many, one, seems mockingly out of step when divide and conquer politics and, and media algorithms have helped turn state against the state, neighbor against neighbor, and lowered our expectations for what we can achieve together. But there was another time, another season, another more hope, hopeful night not long ago that reminds us that America can do better. Fifteen years ago, today's Tuesday, Barack Obama stunned the world by winning the Iowa Democratic Caucuses, the first and the most important step in his long and improbable march to the presidency, preaching a message of unity. Reconciliation, reconciliation, and reform to the country deeply divided over the war in Iraq and bogged down by hyper partisanship in Washington. Obama began his campaign as a decided long shot. That Iowa, one of the weakest states in the nation, would one that Cold winter night embraced a young black man just three years removed from the Illinois Senate sent a signal of seriousness and possibility about his candidacy. Candidacy. It also gloriously de defied the conventional wisdom about the limit of what was possible in America. All those of us who worked in Obama's campaign, it was an unforgettable night, a moving affirmation, affirmation, not just and not just of the unique, uniquely talented candidate. It was a test of the idea that there was a more we shared as Americans than the things that drove us apart, and that ordinary citizens had the power to come together and change the course of the history. The Caucasus were the culmination of the year of earnest conversations between Obama and Iowans in their homes, schools, and businesses, and their gathering places. These conversations were amplified by young staffers and thousands of volunteers, many of many of whom took leave of their homes and jobs and embedded themselves in Iowa to help bring change and progress to the country. So tight, tight were the bonds between these organizers and the local residents that one young Obama staffer was asked by residents in Argona, Iowa, the small town he was organizing to stay after the Caucasus and run for the local city council. Iowans also played their essential role, showing up for candidate meetings and putting the candidates through their paces. 
understanding the importance of Iowa as host to the first in the nation nominating contest, many of its citizens would wind up having multiple conversations with the candidate candidate before committing to support one in the caucuses. The limb lines and the drive vice were non-starters. If a prospective per- president wanted the caucus um, commitment, they had better be prepared for serious conversations. And these conversations were not simply performative. The 87 days he spent in Iowa leading up to the caucuses made Obama, who was new to national politics, a much better candidate, and it would make him a better president. He listened copiously to people's stories and ideas and their reactions to his own and it helped helped him hone his thinking and president presentation. Iowa also right sized the candidate. Once while we are traveling, Obama was asked to call a high school students leader in Iowa where young people would who would turn 18 by election day could participate in the caucuses. Our political team on the ground suggested that these students might be the key to unlocking as many as the dozen caucus commitments from he, from her classmates. Obama called it and greeted her with a cheerful hello, but the girl quickly cut it off. I'm about to go into class, she explained. Could you call back later? Obama handed the phone back and smiled as he recounted the brief exchange. Man, this running for president can be the humbling thing. The run-up to the Caucasus took place during the frigid holiday season of 2007. Obama, his voice all, all but shot, Bond stormed the snowy state as a fl- fresh wave of volunteers flooded in to knock on doors and step phone, phone, step phones in search of a last minute commitment before caucus day. The campaign headquarters in downtown Des Moines, strewn with coffee cups and the pizza boxes, were overflowing with people and energy and uh, buoyant sense of mission. My wife Susan and our youngest son were among the volunteers working the main hotline in the adjoining, unheated our nets cheerfully bundled up against the cold. Susan took the particularly moving call, moving call from a woman who desperately wanted to stand for Obama at her local caucus where neighbors organized themselves into sections of a room according to their candidate preference. But I'm in a wheelchair and can't stay, the woman said anxiously. Will they still count me? Once the caucuses were underway, I tried to persuade Susan and my son to join me at the hall where Obama would speak. I was confident from report I was receiving that we were going to win and I wanted to share the moment with my family. I want to stay just in case there are some late calls, she said. When Susan finally arrived at the hall, the results were clear. I spotted her and knifed through the crowd. I hugged and we cried. It remains one of the most sublime moments I have ever experienced in a lifetime of politics. Obama took the stage and his speech beautifully captured the meaning of the journey. You know, they they said this day would never come, he he began. They They said our sights were set too high. They said that this country too was too divided, too disillusioned to ever come together around the common purchase. But on this January night, at this defining moment in history, you have the what the cynics, cynics said we, could, we couldn't do in lines that stretched around the schools and churches. He 
small towns and the big cities, so you came together as Democrats, Republicans, and Independent to stand up and say that we are one nation, we are one people, and our time for change has come. Fifteen years later, it all feels like a distant memory. The Iowa Democratic Caucuses are on their way out. The victim of their clumsy administration in 2020 and the desire within the party to promote to party to promote a more racially racially diverse states to open the nomination process. A bitter irony to Iowa Democrat, I'm sure, given the extraordinary role the Caucasus played in launching America's first broad black president. More important, the possibility for na- national reconciliation, Iowa signed the signal that that night may seem to many like a fade in the dream, given the extreme polarization and the angry, angry re- reactionary politics that we have seen since then. But democracy is the perpetual struggle between hope and the cynicism. I recall that wonderful, soaring night 15 years ago, not only as a fond memory, but, but as a reminder of what 